Hey folks, we're back at it again with another root video, and this time we're covering the second clockwork expansion with automated lizards, otters, crows, and moles. And there's a lot to cover, so I want to jump right in, but there are a few important things to mention first. The big thing is that since this is the second clockwork video I've done, I won't be repeating the basics of playing with bots. If you don't know about that, check out the first section of my original clockwork video, and I'll see you here when you get back. Say hi to Pache for me while you're there. Assuming you now know how the bots function, there are a couple added bits for the original bots, but mostly this box is all about those new factions. And the last thing for me to say is that because I do not have the mathematical perfection of a robotic mind, I occasionally make a mistake here or there. If that happens, I'll be posting any corrections in the Klingon subtitles, so please turn those on or check the description box below. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get started with the logical lizards and the riverfolk robots. So, as with the last clockwork video, I'll be covering the broad strokes and important details of these factions, and then giving a sample turn. We'll have two bot players and one human playing as the cats, but for now, let's look at the logical lizards. Much like the normal human-powered lizards, this faction is all about converting heathens to their reptilian ways. These bots also use the lizard's lost souls mechanic, so all spent or discarded cards will go here instead of the discard pile. They go face up, and the order in which they're placed should be maintained. The revenge ability is a little different in that when they lose warriors during another player's turn, they only get to put one into their acolytes. And the last new condition is that when a garden of theirs is removed, you discard the top card from the Lost Souls pile. Now the general flow of the lizard's turn is to see what suit is most prevalent, use that as the ordered suit for any conspiracies which follow this track, use the top four cards in the Lost Souls to recruit new warriors or acolytes, maybe build some gardens, and then score for the rightmost empty ordered garden space. We're going to see them in action in just a moment, but first, let's look at the Riverfolk robots, because even more so than the lizards, you'll need to be aware of how they affect the game, even when it's not their turn. So these moist merchants are still trying to hawk their wares, and you can buy them just like you can from the normal otters. They do the same thing, but the cost is set based on the number of points the buyer has. On top of that, the other bots can buy from them too, and they'll follow these basic services rules to determine whether or not they want what the otters are selling. The two main rules to consider are that they can buy services at any time during their turn, and that they won't buy anything if they have fewer points than the Riverfolk. They'll buy mercenaries if they have two or fewer warriors in a battle clearing and the otters can help, or if they can't place a building when they want to and having the otters on their side would change that. As for buying cards, they'll do so only to help them craft. If the card they drew for crafting doesn't have an item on it and there's an available one in the market, they'll buy it. This replaces the card they drew, and keep in mind, this might change their ordered suit. If there's more than one item, they'll take the one of the highest value, even though they can only score one point. And lastly, the bots will never buy riverboats, because they're afraid of short-circuiting. Now, there are a few other faction-specific exemptions, but if you want to get even more granular, each faction has an advanced services card that will give them some other condition for which they'll buy something, but these are optional. Okay, so that was how other factions interact with the riverfolk, but what do they do? Well, unsurprisingly, they'll want you to buy their stuff, and doing so will directly fuel their score. Their order is determined by the rightmost card in their market, which they'll fill up at the beginning of their turn. They'll be building trade posts and recruiting warriors based on that as well, but unlike the normal otters, if their trade posts are removed, they'll go back to their board, and whoever removed it takes half of their warriors out of the funds box, rounded up. But the biggest new abilities they have come from their protectionism conditions. In the middle of their turn, they'll check to see if they have no warriors in their payments box and or their supply, fulfilling the shield and sword conditions respectively. If this is the case, they'll activate extra abilities for the rest of their turn, helping them recruit even more and go to war just about everywhere. But of course, their main points come from sales, so at the end, they'll give back the warriors of the most represented faction and score them any points. Now all of that was just a broad overview, so let's get down to the table and see it all in action. This is a turn or two into the game, and as we can see, the cats are doing their catty thing, the lizards have expanded a bit, and the otters are starting to look a little aggressive. The lizards begin their turn by finding their order based on which suit is the strongest in the Lost Souls, which in this case is mice. Next, because we have at least one acolyte, we'll perform conspiracies. Start by moving the outcast token to the right, or in our case, wrapping around to the beginning, and then taking the action we covered if possible. We'll convert in a mouse space, but it's important to note that we choose the target player first, then look at clearings. Tiebreaker for players is most points, so the cats, then the clearing with the most enemy buildings. We would target this space, but the key prevents us from placing anything here, so that's not an option. 
The next best choice is Space Nine, so we replace a cat with a lizard and remove an acolyte for performing this conspiracy. Next, we'll crusade in a mouse clearing, again going for Space Nine because it's the only mouse clearing where we have any lizards. We each took a hit, but nothing to write home about. Again, we spend an acolyte to perform the conspiracy, and now we're all out, so we move on to Daylight, where we perform some rituals. To do this, we reveal the top four cards in the Lost Souls and take an action based on each one. This mouse will have us recruit in a mouse space, and we're first looking for clearings with empty building slots, then the most enemy buildings. That's clearing number nine again, so that's where we go, and because we now rule the space, it gets a garden. The second mouse card will be different though, because number nine doesn't have any open slots anymore. Instead, we'll go to clearing seven. We don't rule it yet, but we could if we hire the river folk as mercenaries. Since they don't have more points than us, we'll pay for that service and drop a second garden. The third lost soul is a bird, which has us taking a lizard from the clearing with the most and turning it into an acolyte. Then, because it's like a bird, it'll only fly away, we discard this card instead of holding onto it. And lastly, this rabbit will have us place in clearing five, and since we still have the otters on our side, we'll place another garden. Once daylight is done, we'll move on to evening, scoring points for the rightmost ordered empty garden space, so two points here, then discarding all cards still in the Lost Souls pile, and returning the revealed cards, maintaining their order. And lastly, we'll reveal the top card and craft it if possible. This isn't a craftable card for us, so we look at the River Folk's market. Since there are two item cards there, and they still don't have more points than us, we'll take the highest value card and craft it, getting us one last point. So that's the Lizard's turn. Up next is the River Folk Robots. First thing to do is fill up the market. We've got three cards already, so we draw two and add them to the right side. There are a couple items available, so we'll craft the leftmost one and score a point, remembering to send the card to the Lost Souls. Of the remaining cards, the rightmost one will be our order card. In daylight, we're going to build a trade post and recruit a warrior in an ordered clearing, looking for a space with lizards because they have the most warriors in our payments. 8 and 12 are both possibilities, so we use the standard clearing priority and choose space 8. Next, we'll recruit in all fox clearings, but since we only have three otters left, we start at the highest priority and work our way down. Now we need to check our protectionism conditions. We certainly don't qualify for the shield, but since we put out the last of our otters, we do trigger the swords, meaning that we'll score a point, and if we could, we would recruit some more otters. For each of the following steps, we'll perform any actions with the swords next to them. So up next, we battle in each ordered clearing, targeting the cats whenever we need to choose between opponents, because they haven't paid us enough to be their friends. In the evening, we'll see which faction has the most warriors in our payments box and score one point for each before returning them. Then we'll do some racketeering, finding any clearings where we have three or more otters and returning all but two to our payments box. Lastly, we discard the leftmost card in the market and end our turn. So, now that we've seen a sample turn for the lizards and otters, up next are the Drillwit Duchy and the Cogwheel Corvids. <laughs> As we make our way to the underworld, we start with the devious and chaotic plots of the Cogwheel Corvids. These crows aren't much for fighting, but their plots can be difficult and costly to remove. Their special abilities are mostly the same, but unlike the human-controlled crows, you have no means of exposing these plots. If you want to get rid of them, you'll have to fight them. The plots themselves are all the same, save for the bomb, which gets replaced with another plot after exploding. The second plot is placed face up and doesn't apply its flip effect if it has one. The plots will also score in much the same way as before, but the robotic crows will be recruiting and battling a fair bit more often now. After battling, they'll move if they're too clumped up, and they'll try to put a new plot or two down. Then they'll score extra for coins and end their turn. For the most part, a pretty easy faction to manage, but if playing with multiple bots, the plot interaction changes a bit, as shown on this card. While bombs destroy all human pieces in a clearing, machines are tougher than their fleshy counterparts, so bombs only remove two bot pieces first hitting warriors, then tokens, then buildings. The snare also works differently. If a bot were to place in or move from a snared clearing, they instead remove the snare and cancel that part of the action. The enemy bot doesn't score any points for removing the snare, though. Okay, so that's all for now about the crowbots. Let's move on to the Drillbit Duchy and their metal ministers. Unlike the regular moles, you don't need to worry about the minister cards. All the minister positions are printed on the board, and when you need to sway one of them, just place a crown on their corresponding animal icon. Whenever any of their buildings are destroyed, you'll remove the lowest crown from the list, but these crowns aren't removed from the game, so that minister could come back. The burrow is still here and follows the same basic concepts. Moles are going to be recruited there and will dig their way up to various spots on the board. 
There are a few specific instructions for how this can go, but they're pretty easy to follow. After digging, battling, building, and ministering, the moles that have ventured too far will return to safety and score for the markets they've built before swaying another minister. And since that's all you really need to know, let's run through a turn. Once again, the cats are fully feline, the crows have a bit of presence, and the moles seem to have two main strongholds. Starting with the crows, we reveal an order card. There's nothing to craft, so we move on to recruiting two crows in each of two rabbit clearings. We're looking for clearings with no plots already, so that cancels out clearing 10 and then with the most corvid warriors. Since none of the other locations have any crows, we use the standard clearing priority and recruit in three and four. Next, we flip each face down plot token on the map. There's only this one on 10 and it's a snare. There are now two face up plots, so we score two points. At the beginning of daylight, we battle in each bunny clearing with two or more warriors. So that's just gonna be three and four because the others either don't have enemies or crows. In three, we have to pick our target. So we go for the enemy with the most buildings and tokens in the clearing the moles. The battle goes well, but when we do the same thing in clearing four, we get wiped out. Next, we need to move, but we only move from clearings where there are more than two crows and a face-up plot. That's the case in clearing 10, so we're looking for an adjacent clearing with no plots. The first tiebreaker is most crows, but since our two options don't have any, we're next going to look for the lowest clearing priority. Next, we find the clearing with the most warriors and no plot. There are a few options, so we choose space three because it's the highest priority, and replace one warrior with a random face down plot. Once that's done, if we had any clearings with three or more warriors and no plots, the plot would thicken, but in my experience, this doesn't happen that often. Lastly, we'll score one more point for the face up extortion plot and discard our order card, ending the turn. So the moles got bopped on the nose. Let's see if they'll retaliate. As with the crows, they start by revealing an order card. Again, there's nothing to craft, but this bird card will definitely give them some flexibility. They recruit next, putting two moles in the burrow, plus one for their citadel and another for their suede four mole. Because they now have more than four warriors in the burrow, they'll dig, meaning we need to find the clearing with the most enemy buildings and tokens. Looking out, we see this cat space right for the taking, so that's where our expeditionary force will go. We place a tunnel and four moles from the burrow in this location. Next, we battle in each ordered clearing, and since we drew a bird, that's everywhere. Of course, there are only two clearings where we have moles and opponents, so we start in the highest priority clearing, number three. We have an option of targets, so we go after the player with the most buildings, then pieces, then points. Since the crows have a plot and the cat is there by itself, the crows are our enemy. Because we've swayed the captain and we have a tunnel in this clearing, we'll deal an extra hit on this attack, but the crows also deal an extra hit for their embedded agent. In the end, we deal two hits to their one, so we lose a mole and they lose everything. The battle with the cats goes well, but we suffer some losses there too. Next, we would build in the clearing we rule with the most duchy warriors, but since none of those clearings have any space left, and since we still have buildings on our player board, we instead score one point. And the last part of daylight is to take the actions of all our swayed ministers. The captain is skipped because it doesn't really have an action, so we go to the marshal, who lets us place a warrior in clearing three because it has the fewest warriors and at least one duchy building. We then skip the formal and take the mayor's action, also in clearing three, scoring us another point. That's all of our ministers, so we move on to evening where we start by rallying. In each ordered clearing with no duchy buildings and two or fewer moles, we move to an adjacent clearing with buildings or the burrow if there are no good spots. There is a good spot here though, so we head down to clearing four, and then if we had more than four moles in a ruled clearing, they would go to the burrow. Since we don't, we'll move on to scoring one point for our market, swaying the top most unswayed minister, and then discarding the order card and ending our turn. And with that, I hope you have a good sense of how to play the second clockwork expansion of Root. Now there are a couple spots here and there where I saw differences between the player boards and the rulebook, and while there is no official errata at the time of recording, I have found a BGG post with some clarifications that has gotten approval by the lead designer of this expansion. In case you're interested, there's a link to that in the description box below. And with that, I shall bid you adieu. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.